Greetings. Brother Mark here from St. Louis King of France Parish in Bucktown, Louisiana. Today, March 17th, is St. Patrick's Day. Born Magnus Sucatus Patricius on the west coast of Roman Britain, circa 385 AD, into the provincial imperial establishment of present-day England. His mother was related to St. Martin of Tours. At the age of 16, Patrick was captured by a raiding party of Celtic pagans from Hibernia, the present-day Ireland, and brought to what is now County Mayo in Northwestern Ireland, where he endured six years of slavery. When the Celtic tribes mobilized in 407 AD to drive out the Roman occupation, Patrick was able to escape bondage in the confusion. He crossed the channel, escaped to Gaul, present-day France. It is not possible to accurately reconstruct the next few years, but historical surveillance next locates Patrick on the island of Lorraine, off the coast of Nice in the Mediterranean, living in a monastery established by St. Honoratus. Born and raised a pagan, Honoratus converted to Christianity, along with his brother, under the spiritual direction of St. Caprasius. Caprasius was a hermit, following the example of St. Anthony of the Desert. The three decided to go to the Holy Land and to Egypt to see the monastic movement in its original context. Honoratus' brother died on the journey, but when Caprasius and Honoratus returned, they established the monastery on Lorraine. They chose the Pacomian style of monasticism for safety, that is the community style monasticism, establishing their foundation between 400 and 405 AD. By the time St. Patrick arrived, an escaped slave, about five years later. He met a group of monks there who shaped the rest of his life, and through him, in turn influenced the direction of the Western Church as the Roman Empire crumbled. Patrick found it his, as his spiritual director, St. Germanus. Born into an important family of Roman Britain, Germanus had served in the legions and was governor of one of the provinces. In his capacity as governor, he heard of St. Honoratus and his monastic foundation on the island of Lorraine. Once he met the saint, Germanus laid aside his worldly position and entered the community. Another monk was St. Lupus, he was, as a younger man, a married lawyer in Roman Gaul and Avocatus. He was a brother-in-law to St. Hilary of Arles, the first Latin doctor of the church, and he was a friend of St. Germanus. After his wife died, Lupus joined his friend to be a monastic disciple of St. Honoratus on the island of Lorraine. Another monk, was St. Palladius. He was another native of Roman Gaul, though his background is more secure, obscure, until he became part of the community that sought spiritual guidance from St. Honoratus. There he met Patrick and the above-mentioned saints. In the year 415, the same Palladius decided to leave the monastery on Lorraine and travel to Rome seeking guidance from the Pope about how to live out his discerned ecclesiastical vocation. There, he was ordained a priest by the 40th Pope, St. Innocent I, and ordained a bishop by the, by the 43rd Pope, St. Celestine I. In 429, Bishop Palladius was given the mission by Pope Celestine of traveling to Roman Britain 
to investigate the state of the church as the province was out of contact in the collapsing Roman Empire. Afterward, he was to continue west and establish the faith on the island of Hibernia, present-day Ireland. Palladius was intended by the Pope to be the first bishop to the Hibernian Celts. For assistance, Bishop Palladius sought out his old friends on the monastery of Lorraine, but found that in the intervening years, they also had been called away to other duties. St. Germanus was ordained a bishop in 418. The founding abbot, St. Honoratus, was made a bishop in 426. Later the same year, St. Lupus was made a bishop. In 431, bishops Germanus and Lupus agreed to join Bishop Palladius on the initial reconnaissance into Britain and Hibernia. A group of monks from Lorraine came along to remain in service to Palladius. Among them was the monk Patrick, whom St. Germanus ordained a priest in order that he could provide sacramental service as a missionary monk. In this way, Patrick returned to the land he escaped 24 years earlier. He was now 46. Bishop Palladius became ill on the journey. Patrick discovered, to his surprise, the provision in canon law that three bishops can ordain a new bishop. Before Palladius died, he, Germanus, and Lupus ordained Patrick as bishop to continue the mission. Palladius died, so it was left to Patrick to establish the first see, the first diocese in Ireland. He did so at Armagh in present-day Ulster County in territory that is still occupied. Patrick's mission succeeded on a scale to change history. In 439, three other bishops arrived to expand the work in the South. In 457, their progress merited a synod to establish the initial canons governing the church in Ireland. The historian is continually frustrated in the search for Patrick's life. Very few primary sources have survived and his impact was so great that legends grew surrounding his deeds. He became not only the true founder of the Irish church, but also a folk hero for the Irish people. Even his date of death is subject to dispute. One tradition, which we have followed here, places his death in 461, in the same year as Pope Leo the Great. Another tradition places his death as late as 493, giving him a 60-year tenure as bishop. Either is possible. His enduring contributions, his skillful manipulation of the often delicate process of diffusion, acculturation, and synthesis. Assimilation between Catholicism and Irish Celtic culture. His promotion of a native clergy among the Hibernian Celts who would serve the church for 15 centuries. The particular circumstances of the conversion of Ireland gave the church a distinctive character apart from Celtic culture, yet never entirely separate. The missionaries who brought Christianity to Ireland were Pacomian monks. As a result, the church in early medieval Ireland centered on monasteries more than dioceses. The ecclesiastical leaders tended to be abbots of these Irish monasteries. They came to wield a scope of influence far beyond that of abbots on the continent, often serving simultaneously as abbot and bishop. As the Roman Empire fell and the Dark Ages swept across Europe, it was the descendants, the spiritual sons, grandsons, great-grandsons 
of these first missionaries inspired by Patrick, who came back to continental Europe with the faith, bringing with them not only the Pacomian tradition of monastic spirituality, which healed Patrick after his years of slavery, but also the strong Roman tradition from the Holy See, which was brought by St. Palladius, shared with his fellow monks who became bishops and ordained Patrick, so that both traditions survived outside of the perimeter of what had been the Roman Empire to be brought back so that the church could serve the purpose of rebuilding civilization and culture after the Roman Empire fell, rebuilding it within the context of the Catholic faith, therefore making the medieval period the age of faith. Although there is much more we would like to know about St. Patrick, we never have as many primary sources as we wish. Yet we do have in the Office of Readings, which all priests, bishops, and religious are required to say, we do have an excerpt from St. Patrick's Confessions, chapters 14 through 16. This is a, a quote, extended quote from, uh, from Patrick. I give unceasing thanks to my God who kept me faithful in the day of my testing. Today, I can offer him sacrifice with confidence, giving myself as a living victim to Christ, my Lord, who kept me safe through all my trials. I can say now, who am I, Lord, and what is my calling, that you worked through me with such divine power? You did all this so that today, among the Gentiles, I might constantly rejoice and glorify your name wherever I may be, both in prosperity and in adversity. You did it so that whatever happened to me, I might accept good and evil equally, always giving thanks to you, my God. God showed me how to have faith in him forever as one who is never to be doubted. He answered my prayers in such a way that in the last days, ignorant though I am, I might be bold enough to take up so holy and so wonderful a task and imitate in some degree those whom the Lord had so long ago foretold as heralds of his gospel, bearing witness to all nations. How did I get this wisdom? that was not mine before. I did not know the number of my days or have knowledge of God. How did so great and salutary a gift come to me, the gift of knowing and loving God, though at the cost of my homeland and my family? I came to the Irish people to preach the gospel and endure the taunts of unbelievers, putting up with reproaches about my earthly pilgrimage, suffering many persecutions, even bondage, and losing my birthright of freedom for the benefit of others. If I am worthy, I am ready also to give up my life without hesitation for his name. I want to spend myself in that country, even in death. If the Lord should grant me this favor, I am deeply in his debt, for he gave me the great grace that through me many peoples should be reborn in God and then made perfect by confirmation and everywhere among them clergy ordained for a people so recently coming to believe, one people gathered by the Lord from the ends of the earth, as God had prophesied of old through the prophets. The nation shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, How false are the idols made by their fathers. They are useless. In another prophecy he said, I have set you as a light among the nations to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It is among that people 
that I want to wait for the promise made by him, who assuredly never tells a lie. He makes this promise in the gospel. They shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is our faith. Believers are to come from the whole world. Let us pray. God, our Father, you sent St. Patrick to preach your glory to the people of Ireland. By the help of his prayers, may all Christians proclaim your love throughout the world. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In conclusion, stay cautious, stay calm, stay safe. St. Patrick, pray for us. Thank you for your attention. Session adjourned. <laughs>